human beings do that stuff. And related more close home uh, to my our uh, recipient of uh, computer science. So I call it computational psychology. It's, a, it's an organized uh, field. Uh, I mean, it has all of these things uh, machine learning, uh, natural language processing, computational linguistics, and some kind of a, uh, a psychology of uh, languages, psychophysics of language understanding and all that. So uh, that's all I can say. So it's a correct collection of pieces of stuff which is going on in our group. I have a few uh, additional data on some of the work and some publication stuff and all that. Uh, we have the students all in the same folder, just come to it. But two or three salient new points about graph models is what I want to touch upon. And some experimental with respect to how human being, uh, human participants look at uh, uh, visual cues from using eye tracker. So these two are the things to learn. So, of course, you know, this is just, uh, this was a collection of slides which I read earlier. So some things are sticking, some things are intersection with uh, the earlier one, but I all the same when I run through uh, some of the So, of course, you know, uh, the hog versus the hog. But in this point of this disease, once in a while. Uh, of course, there are certain things that you know, I, I just run through the slides just because they are there. Some things I just want to open it. They are meant for different occasions. Uh, but then, essentially, the so called mentalist uh, reasoning with the uh, mental representations, uh, we call it mental computations. And uh, uh, it has these different facets of uh, to perform these, uh, the cognitive apparatus uh, has been layered or, or I mean, structure into substrates, resources, processes, and uh, models, etc. Now, uh, the context of broad packet of my presentation, some technical details of some of them, or the first one is called a concept association network. That's what uh, I just alluded to the beginning and I presented some result of one of our students, part of this thesis. Uh, on the main graph models for the concepts and then uh, reason about those graphs and correlated with the uh, performance. Uh, then there's another thing on how to play with words, the word morph game, and then something about eye tracker use of this, and then something about when you when you look at things in an eye tracker, you get some what are called scan paths, and uh, this can be used to model in the form of a graph, and which is our continuing quest to understand uh, the correlation between the stimulus domain and the performance uh, uh, arena in a quantitative way. And the approach is that short. Give some tips of this. And all of this are bearing on uh, one big facet of cognitive apparatus of the human beings is process language. There will always be debates about uh, how do you reason within. Uh, the reasoning within is by means of linguistic methodologies or non linguistic methodologies. Probably bifurcation into two, two themes if you want to have. Uh, a lot of it has to do with natural language processing. That's a, maybe a prejudice to you, but also it's a thing you can experiment with yourself. You know. you, you're just talking to somebody that, you know. Without doing a silent uh, replay, uh, you know, quiet replay of the verbal strings uh, which you've heard or read, uh, difficult to talk about and not talk about, difficult to reason or understand about it. So, anyway, natural language understanding uh, is a quest uh, which is uh, inbuilt. Uh, but then it's a very interesting machine world as well. So that's where computer science and cognitive science are, I think, converging in one fat arena in which uh, probably the humans are better and the machines are yet to be anywhere near. So uh, these are things also of some new courses I teach in IIC. Okay, anyway, this, this is a broad slide, which uh, is just a different rendering of the various substrates. The interesting thing is this computational brain is something uh, is a title of a few books. Joseph Bredo, for example, is a pretty good book called Computational Brain. And uh, essentially the computations uh, are to do with something about symbolic manipulation systems. And uh, to reason about those symbols, you need a stringing uh, system which you call language. And uh, 
so the software that uh, uh, the brain uh, called the mind has been several algorithms which are make sense of the mind you need to based on some kind of things. So I'll skip the last data with uh, about this, uh, this cognitive apparatus which is uh, cast into this uh, data shapes somewhere. But one is uh, uh, an extrapolation as to, uh, okay, this is not to psycholinguistics and computation thing, but the resources to have as a hardware uh, as opposed to the resources which the physical hardware will build and is, is, uh, is a background. So essentially what can a brain do is uh, an assessment which I make, which can only affect uh, like, you know, the whole of the brain. So it's cast like this, you know, just to the uh, 33 neurons, which is about 8, 8 billion, and then neurons, 11 billion neurons. Firing all the time, uh, this is about 2 to 6 firing rates per second based on the cycle times of uh, uh, action potential, including some, uh, ignoring some refractory effects and all those things. Uh, four in four bits per uh, firing. There are some uh, research literatures on what does a neuron do, I mean, how much information does it uh, convey. Uh, by itself, it can't convey much. But then the groups of neurons, as I said, there are something called tuning curves, uh, tuned to certain uh, certain red coding, say uh, 100 neurons at a neighborhood fire at about uh, 200 milliseconds uh, red uh, or 5 per second, uh, let's say 10 per second, around synchronized will recognize something. So that recognizing something is attached to a few bits of uh, put it even a single neuron, very deliberately a full information bits and so on. So at a human lifetime of 2 to the 32 seconds, which is uh, 128 years, to 25 seconds times uh, per year times 128. Uh, that's all it can do. Which is essentially saying the human brain processes about uh, 2 to the 75 bits of information. It's, it looks a lot, uh, it is a lot, uh, but then uh, in certain domains of computer science, uh, not phased by such numbers. This is the sort of equivalent of. Uh, Think a thousand machines uh, processing for about uh, a billion years. So that's all right. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. So most of, but most of the information would be redundant. Yeah. So True. Actually, so the number that upper bound. Yeah. Correct. That's why you wanted to put you know it's a finite thing, and this this is what's called as the processing power. Now there are I/O devices, all the five polarities and three principal this this side. This uh, humans and they receive information and send out emit information and uh, put all those together. You know, you can further reduce the processing capabilities. Like in a computer machine, you know, I/O devices will cause interrupts and, uh, and so on. So anyway, uh, nevertheless, uh, I said that's coming out. But take out many factors of power of two, it will still not be too bad. You know, we want to do the 65 axis. Okay. So sensory outputs, input, motor outputs, cognitive, emotional, memory access related transductions, interrupts, response activation, all those things, which all happen all the time. Uh, but in a very, very, not all the, all <coughs> the place. Okay. It's an immensely parallel distributed computing system, but doesn't work all the time like that machine. So the thing is, sometimes it boils down to something called thinking and thoughts and uh, something. So there have been various terms associated with this uh, thought unit, uh, just a normal creature. Or that there's a thing physical an ingram. At the rate of 22 to the 25 bits per ingram. Now this is some just just a just a just a just a guess. Uh, an engram is a thought unit. It sort of encodes for something, something fun, a color. What is the color? Red, some number of headstrops or something. In the visual spectrum, so many uh, oxybutyl globe neurons, uh, synchronous firing and some such thing will be this color red and so on. So that at some level of representation will entail a, a unit of representation called an engram. And uh, it's just a long name, but I just use that name to lift these uh, numbers uh, 2 to the 50 engrams 
And now, this engram is still not part. The cognitive mechanism for conversion of this mentalism of engrams would work out to about 2 to the 30 or billion thoughts in a lifetime. Just, you know, something like just take off 1 million. You know, even in machines when you represent things, even a lot of sparse uh, uh, encodings, you can just represent big bits of stuff. You can represent lexical, dictionaries, and all of that. But to capture thoughts and things like that uh, in a form, you require a certain number of bits. A million bit, uh, 2 to the 20 bits is not a bad thing at all. So just put that in. So essentially, it's just a finite number of thoughts. I just call it a billion thoughts. Whatever it means. And the suitable computation models and encodings. Uh, okay, anyway, this can all be captured in some way. The very this time is the very process of the process, the language process, and uh, okay. The one thing which will come to again and again, there are some representations. The mental representations is the thing. The previous things we alluded to. Uh, a hypothetical uh, language model, I call it the markup. You need a, every markup language uh, requires something called a point or a tag. Uh, in the cognitive science, they are called as reference in, in Fodor and Revolution uh, uh, framework. Uh, they, they, there is something called a referent. The referent has a causal relationship with the symbol referred. Uh, word objects uh, have a mental index. You know, it's like this bottle, which is stuck a cord, and uh, there's a tag called bottle. The bottleness of this is all there in some disk and so on. So that's called a referent. So that's the idea. So a referent is like a tag, point. Uh, you know, in computer programming languages, you call it point. Point there, there resides that. And that thing, descriptor, if the descriptor is too long, you store another pointer somewhere, and you change the system of pointers. So these are kinds of models which are thought about in, uh, uh, in computational models of uh, uh, thought mechanisms. Uh, exemplified by one, uh, is one work of a book called On, 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 on Intelligence. Okay. So essentially, this is both philosophic as well as quantitative uh, uh, material. That there is a referent which is akin to a tag, and uh, you use those all the time. So now you come to, you know, somewhere there is a linguistic slant over the tag. The tag itself is a name. Okay, and so on. So when I talk about a cognitive mark of language, it's going to be a way of describing all these tags. Now these tags can be, you can call it an auditory tag, auditory cue for the sound of this, okay, a, a, a shape cue, a color cue, all kinds of things. So each tag gives you a different way of addressing the same object and some different properties. Um, of course, you know, using these things you can you can, you can build a, something called a cognitive market language, but that can be superimposed over a network of different types of networks, theories, there are various types of theories which I uh, advocated earlier. Uh, okay, that's one side. Now I just want to get into some computational stuff. That I just pursue on the, uh, the earlier line of reasoning. But um, there are many dichotomous, uh, uh, dichotomous uh, explanations which uh, offer you mechanisms for, again, okay, mental representation, the reason for mental representation. So, this I call, what I call a grammar of thought versus a grammar of randomness. So, there is a, a huge thing in all of science, part of science. And many parts of that and so on. But apparently random, uh, you know, local, locally random phenomena, locally random phenomena uh, leading to globally uh, organized phenomena. Okay. So apparently the, the neurons firing the civil neuron, the two hundreds, and aggregates of neurons, it all look like, uh, uh, it, it's like random. Okay. Maybe they can do a minuscule reasoning about classifying like in a neural network which you can build, you're classifying uh, uh, this line versus this line or something like that. But that's not the thought of the way they talk about it. Okay? Similarly, reasoning about uh, the letter A versus uh, letter B or something like that. Now, but from there stems this hierarchical organization 
of uh, uh, aggregates of yours into what are called systems of uh, maps. Uh, okay. In general, logical way, uh, uh, aggregates into layers and uh, maps and uh, systems. Okay. So, which should help you build this uh, uh, business of thought. So, likewise, you have this uh, different uh, types of uh, dichotomous uh, frameworks. Uh, chunking is one thing which shows you. It's a very, very inherently cognitive mechanism, in particular human cognitive mechanism when it comes to uh, everything with words and uh, language, as opposed to continuous streaming of data. In particular, the modality of auditory does not facilitate you this chunking, whereas the, the visual modality uh, gives you a facility to chunk. So, the counterparts and many different uh, things are being noticed. Uh, Civilization, I mentioned last time, at a glance, if this is uh, finger extensiation with reference to reference. Uh, this is like extensiating a pointer, fetch a pointer, then look at the data or pointer, fetch another pointer, it's not uh, data and so on and so forth. So, that's another mechanism. So, this is more like a sequential chained way of getting things. This is like a glance. So obviously, we will do contrasting uh, uh, mechanisms, but invoked uh, depending on the name. And the uh, same applies to protein versus model. You know, uh, protein <coughs> is all subitized, meaning you're just recognizing one, two, three, maybe you have a the table chain, and all those little things. But uh, the novel stimuli is what makes uh, the cognitive apparatus going. So, uh, there seems to be a collection of things. In fact, I put on the left hand side uh, some kinds of uh, uh, meta, uh, meta percepts, which each would serve as a tag for something. Uh, when you look at things, you have many tags. So, the cognitive mark of language has multiple tags, and I would invite something like tags based on this, this, this. Uh, Okay, now, um, so in order to build a different language, I put some graph models. So I will show you some a few, few graph models. So this one is called a concept association network. And uh, part of it was looked at by Arun, my partner. So this is a data from uh, a small subset of uh, standardized uh, lexicon of words. Uh, predominantly nouns, which stand for some concepts. So, apparently people are asked to say, uh, tell me, what do you, what comes to your mind? By looking at, uh, say, a word like cat. So you get all these uh, things which come to your mind. Then you put a H to be there. And so, it all comes to, right, and so on and so forth. So, this is, uh, the standardized corpus from British University. This experiment can be repeated, but uh, some uh, basics set. The, the, the point is to look at how people go from concept to concept. So the entire lexicon is not important, but uh, some collection of this. But you know, a graph looks like this. It has some properties of what is generally called uh, Nascale networks. Uh, in Nascale networks, one is interested in uh, some aggregate properties of various kinds of uh, graph parametrics. So a few of them like this. So this particular thing has uh, 10,000 words and uh, they are generally sparse. Uh, see, the, you ask what is related, uh, it will turn out that uh, you will get about seven relations quickly. Uh, <coughs> what comes a strong relation to some other concept. Okay. So that's, that's sort of reflected in what's called the diameter of this graph. So, this graph is uh, generally sparse. <coughs> the large scale networks are these kinds of parameters. So, generally sparse means uh, there are only about 63,000 uh, edges, uh, 30,000. So, average degree is about uh, uh, 
well, which is a double of that, both ways it's counted. Uh, half of it is 6. And uh, edge density local neighborhoods are average, is very small. Maximum degree is, of course, quite high. And uh, there are some words like get or something like that. They tend to get an R general uh, or a box or something. Diameter is about the path lengths and the length of the longest paths and the, uh, over every pair of vertices, the uh, diameter of a graph. So for every vertex, we take the shortest paths, which are for every vertex u, to any vertex v in the graph, the length of the uh, shortest path is called the eccentricity of the vertex, and maximum of this between every pair is called the diameter. So, diameter virtually looks like the rate diameter. Very polar, very far apart. Maximum is called the diameter. The minimum of that eccentricity is called the radius. This is a measure of uh, how distant things are connected. So, this means to say that any pair of uh, vertices on this graph is separated by at most seven uh, hops. So, that's a typical, uh, uh, what's called as a small world phenomenon. And then uh, the other thing is about this. Uh, there's something about these graphs. Uh, they get sort of clustered. They are densely here, 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 few. That's it. And the rest of the graph is all sparse. So that's called, uh, it reflected in what's called as a degree distribution. There will be a small number of vertices with a large degree. There will be a large number of vertices with small degree. That's a typical phenomenon in many, uh, many natural networks. We call it social networks, natural networks. So this gamma is uh, the, the part of a uh, number of vertices of a certain degree with a degree has a quick drop, uh, came to the degree to the power of minus 2.6. So that's called the gamma of that. Uh, so it drops off exponentially with degree or a value of, or a scale of value of 2.6. So d to the power of minus 2.6 is the this gamma. Now, that's of course uh, expected norm. <coughs> so the clustering coefficient is locally how densely every vertex among all possible neighbors it can have, what it really has. It's called a clustering coefficient. So these are some standard uh, measures and there are a few more. See these can all be used to do classification of whether two different graphs of, from this kind or of the same kind. So one <coughs> how would you decide this? Uh, how would you compute this uh, gamma? That is the same coefficient. Okay, we just separate. Is it in formula for that or is it No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, the, the, the formula, it, it, of course, this is an empirical data. It's a fit of the degree distribution from that graph. It turns out to be d to the power of minus 2.6. That's it. And very close to that skull. Okay. In general, it will be of that nature, which is negative exponential with generally very small uh, exponent. It's not, it doesn't drop just with this whole jump and everything, you know. It gracefully comes down and long tail it has. So the value will be around uh, minus two, three, uh, small value. This is a very good thing. Okay, but what was it, uh, the study was to say, if you, uh, I said coffee and uh, uh, comic. So flash two words, you said coffee, comic, now we we'll go from this word to this word. So this is what is called as a uh, navigating on this network. Okay. So how do really people go from concept to concept to concept to concept? That's the, that's the question. And to study this, we use this start data and then perform experiments. So the, the perform experiments. Uh, okay. Um, 60. Okay. This is a typical uh, usual human participant experiment. With the, you ask him, but this is just a starting point for our uh, uh, some kind of uncontrolled experiment. But this is a very natural thing. One thing is the experiment is common. This has been tested out on various people, uh, imported from somewhere, but then you try your own. Those words are familiar and so on. You should give. Uh, uh, some 
some very coffee and then very uh, strange uh, word, which very rapidly you should think. Okay. So the whole idea was to build out those things and gently control the experiment with uh, going from one concept to another concept word, how do people do? So you ask uh, uh, force to target navigation on uh, roughly about the uh, three chances per participant. So you get about 180 pairs and you get about 180 parts. So this study, uh, a study which I'm mentioning is about the nature of these parts. Okay, now all this is to uh, I mean to say whenever we do such studies on network of navigation, uh, people try to look at three different ways. Okay. Uh, human beings do it in a certain way. The other is uh, uh, what we call random traverses. Okay. Uh, we just choose a coin and with the probability equal to uniform probability of the number of neighbors of a vertex, you take the next uh, so if this vertex has six uh, neighbors, so with one sixth probability to go to any one of them. So that's the random way of going for a network. The other is um, a, what we call a human controlled optimal machine algorithm. Okay. So in this case, what we call a shortest path algorithm. You know, in graphs, uh, you have between a pair of vertices, undirected general, undirected graphs. You <coughs> The shortest path from U to V is a very canonical standard term, uh, algorithm, which is called a two algorithm, but uh, which is just what is called Lysel algorithm, which goes from here to here in the shortest way. So, given any pair of uh, vertices, uh, an optimal way to do would be to take the shortest path. A random thing will choose some random distribution, uh, most often used uniform distribution between x properties. The human is uh, based on what you do in between. So you may not be either. So that's what comes out that uh, the study of this says that uh, uh, shortest paths are bounded by a diameter of the graph. Most of the shortest paths are of the three fold. Human generated paths are about twice as long. The uh, shortest paths show a steeper degree difference than human paths. Uh, okay, what this is a kind of <coughs> post analysis of the shortest path algorithm's behavior, which is just that if you very quickly, it will, the degree differences between vertices on the shortest path are very small, which means the greedy algorithm, which is the best uh, shortest path algorithm, <coughs> takes a quick drop to some things which are uh, sort of important. I mean, they have very few edges going over there, some more land there, and then. So the degree differences are very sharp, quick, whereas the humans are not uh, more uh, uh, agnostic to that uh, degree difference, but we don't know that yet. Okay. The way it happens, you choose, it's, 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 it's not too material. Uh, so that's one uh, finding. Shortest path shows a steeper degree difference. This is the shortest path is symmetric. So this shows the shortest path is symmetric about the center. But center of a graph is again uh, defined with respect to distance. Set of vertices, uh, which sorry for minimal. Yeah. I was just thinking uh, of, of the comparison uh, of the shortest path and the long path. Uh, I mean, look, perhaps looking at both of them from a qualitative perspective might uh, give insight into the meaning that the paths make uh, okay. by going from concept to concept, mm -hmm. uh, which would be, I, mean, I don't know, perhaps. More interesting than the the, the, the quantity. Ah, you have said it, but uh, um, this will apply in a certain uh, other language processing task itself. I'll come to that maybe. It's important. I, I, yeah. See, if the task itself is a language processing task, then there is a bit of uh, semantics and meanings and associated which you leverage. That's what you're hinting at. I agree. But uh, on this, at this level of uh, discussion. A graph of thousand to thousand vertices. I mean, for us, it's it's, it's paths being what they are. Uh, each path will have a different association of that. You know, and it, it's 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 I'm afraid it's difficult to cope with that part. Yeah, the network is more complex than it appears. I mean, when it comes to jumping from concept to concept. 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. But you, you, the, the, one is not striving to delegate all those things. Then it will be too big a problem. Right. right. After all, you might say those ten thousand words are all here. You know, all those ten words you know. There is a thing about uh, that also. All the things you know about all of them are not here. You sort of build them. That also is true. And that's why it's applying approximate reasoning and all that. So the fact that uh, a cat and a tintin or, uh, or a dog and a tintin are related or something is not something you can actually you, 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 you discover it as you are talking and thinking and talking about it. You, you build it. So that's the nature of the investment work. So in some sense, uh, I won't be able to use them. I be here to delineate anything further than this. Maybe it's all that point. So similarly, random box versus uh, So this is okay. Actually, I have uh, data and thoughts of this kind. Just want to flash this. Uh, and there's, a, there's another one which I'm going to show you at this point. Uh, 
insertion deletion allow, uh, which is more like editing stuff. This is a simple game, and it can be nicely played with the uh, kids and uh, people. And the thing of interest to us is how we go. Now, this is no underlying concept, but there is an underlying network. This underlying network, you don't know. The participant doesn't know. You simply see two words, the car and the shine. A try and run, something like that. So you do whatever you want. Now, it should mean whatever you want. What we do is to show the adjacencies. Okay. So in car, you would say cat, cab, all those things will come. Okay. So there's a computer screen you sit and you click and it goes like that. Okay. So essentially, the idea is that you get out of uh, Nia's gate. If you want to go to IAM, you won't go north and east. You go south. Turn left somewhere. You know it is south. So the, the neighboring landmarks, neighbors are north. Then you go to IAC, then Malaysia, and things like that. So from here you go to IAC, you know that road. It's not this road. So these ideas, uh, the network locally is known, is shown to the participants, <coughs> and then he travels and navigates. Uh, again, the experiment is to work several people several times, and they sort of allow them to learn the network. So after learning, is there a learning? And then the learning uh, doesn't lead to some strategizing. And then uh, that strategizing, what is it? Is there any questions? So 20 seconds, uh, 25 seconds play with the uh, 65 pairs. Uh, average time, 26. So sorry, the machine is high. Quite large, sometimes. Of course, it's for a total on the 65. And then it, uh, very quickly comes down to a few bits. So there's a thing about this. Okay. Now, uh, of the big question is, how are we learning these uh, associations? Or are we learning something of these? So what we learn is something we, we realize we do learn. But there is something about uh, the, what's called the clustering coefficient, which is uh, defined as the reciprocal of the sum of uh, local distances, shortest path distances for every vertex. So DUV is the distance between U and V, shortest distance, uh, for every U to the total distance. And then uh, for a particular, uh, this, is, this is V, yeah, this is localized V, this is very fixed here. So this is a measure of the Rank and a uh, volt number. Okay. So, this 
what they consider way um, paid to this day and uh, to the Vivo Hope and the SAP and so on. And uh, this one is a uh, one very much thing called AID. What it seems to say is that there are different types of paths people take which have either these kinds of things or this. So essentially say, from here you go to Malaysia, majestic, uh, I don't know what, uh, well, I don't know the names, but uh, Dhamma and uh, that way. Okay. Uh, so those all have, you can see, many radio roads and things like that. So obviously they have more chances of being uh, hit uh, quickly. Okay. Uh, so this, of course, we call it the strategy of choosing, uh, learning the sectors choosing the center strategy. Uh, so is it that uh, these that the strategies being analyzed and you find the strategies converging as well? Uh, yeah. In fact, all, all, almost all people do the same. So essentially in cognitive science experiment is all we can say. You say do people, all people do the same thing. And what, of course, every usual converges and all other people all people also do conversion and they all converge to something called centers. That's the statement. Now, essentially, this tying up the quantitative uh, element at all levels is the angle, the goal. Uh, there's only one underlying graph on which different people are navigating. There's one road network from here to here. You go one way, you go some way. But eventually, we all say, all of us learn this so called, even if you didn't know anything. You are, you are new to this place, then you are learning from local information. Both the So you have like has this kind of game been played in let's say non-English languages like Tamil or Hindi or something? And what uh, what do we anticipate findings to be? Maybe maybe uh, I don't know. See our felicity with that language you probably yes, 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 yes. So that's why to to remove that uh, Felicity with language, you use some uh, battery of thumb. I think I don't know about 10,000 words. Uh, I think there are a lot of other words which are not known. About 800, 900 uh, standard uh, simple nouns uh, are used in this game tribes, which are supposed to be known to all the people. But in a literate college, I did not write. Obviously, I can't do it on my uh, department watchman or something, which we did some other experiments. Actually, this neutral to this uh, language thing, and I tried it. Scenario for recognizing faces and things like that. So, uh, many, maybe th this is uh, a question which probably needs a, a different type of idea. I guess you to do the careful experimentation. If you say that I do, maybe some equal facility with the language among equal number of participants and uh, uh, that corpus which is uh, yes. standard. I think then probably it will be similar. Anyway, uh, the thing was actually we started with looking at the word, the uh, dictionaries and things like that, but uh, try to do different things. Uh, try to take hops so that you get closer to the center of the network. You don't know the center. We call it the learning the center is the type of strategy. Yes. And after a few times, you get to know the degree distributions uh, eternally. Remember, a few central words are landmarks and use them as via media to navigate. Almost always, you know, they hit some of those words that more, which are very more. And But that depends on the nature of the network. Okay. Uh, some words are very highly like that, sectors. <coughs> Start from source as well as destination and making a decision. A bit closer to the center of the network. And again, it's a lot of things.
time loops. Okay. Uh, you will start of course with the correct model one. Do a parsing for understanding. While you're doing the parsing, you do all the lexical, uh, syntactic, lexical, and semantic analysis. Then there is something called a pragmatic analysis. And at that point, the meaning surfaces. And with the world view and the context, you get a picture of what it says. Okay. This is a, in a nutshell, the whole text of a natural language processing course. Now, but towards the end, as you do, you gain better and better meaning. And what better things to look at than jokes and puns and riddles and so on. Which essentially, the one of the view about jokes and uh, understanding of that stuff and that is, there's a world view you create as you pass. And the world is suddenly changed by towards the end. Everybody will agree that that's the way you understand jokes. And so these are called garden path sentences in uh, semantic analysis of sentences. So this is one example of saying one type of uh, what I call cool jokes. I call it a poor joke generator. There are some, some internet material, but I just cast it to be a uh, symbolic form, which can be encoded into a program, just a two-line program, which can use a lexicon of words, and you can create uh, this called question answer the jokes like uh, uh, something like this automatically. Now, who is it? Traveler in Cuba, Castro. Uh, who is it? Teacher seeking confirmation, they have proof and so on. And so on. Now, this plays with the, the what is called the phoneme and morphine uh, mixing. This kind of mixing gives you a world view, uh, a, a, a kind of a topsy turvy world view at the end. And the result is that the better it is, the better it is. So this is a theory of joke. Now, I'm just trying to say, <laughs> we built, I've generated lots of such uh, sentences and so on, which together with standard parsing, canonical examples for how we parse sentences, we will use to study how human beings study language. So I'll come to that next to the So this is the work option part. OK. Now, you have to do carefully controlled experiments now on this for uh, Understanding language or uh, what do people make out of language? So I'll come to some. Okay, now here's the. Okay, before this, I just show you one more illustration. Last continuation of some thoughts, the last one. About the nature of words themselves. Okay. So, uh, generally, uh, a class of words 